What is symbiosis? Normally when people talk about symbiosis, they're talking about two different types of organisms cooperating to help each other survive. For example, clownfish hide from predators among the tentacles of sea anemones. In return, they feed the anemone with their own <laughs> droppings. Yum yum. The anemone and the clownfish enjoy a symbiotic relationship. In biology, however, symbiosis has a broader definition than simple cooperation. It's classically defined as any long-term living together of unlike organisms. Let me say that again. Symbiosis, the long-term living together of unlike organisms. Mutualistic symbiosis, or mutualism, is when both partners benefit from the relationship, like we saw in the clownfish and the anemone. When I say that both partners benefit from the relationship, what I mean is that both organisms experience a significant increase in evolutionary fitness. They both end up being better at surviving and reproducing. Parasitic symbiosis, or parasitism, is when one benefits while the other is harmed. Ticks are a good example of a parasite. They drink your blood and then sometimes repay you with Lyme disease. Total jerks. Commensalistic symbiosis, or commensalism, is when one organism benefits while the other is not dramatically helped or harmed. Squirrels live in oak trees. They sometimes eat bark, leaf buds, and of course, they love to eat acorns. They consume the flesh of the oak tree's unborn children. This is great for the squirrel, of course, but surely this must be bad for the tree's evolutionary fitness, right? Well, multiple studies have shown that the relationship between oak trees and squirrels is both extremely complex and extremely ancient, apparently stretching back millions of years. Both organisms are trapped in an evolutionary arms race against each other. Through the ongoing process of descent with modification, acted upon by selection, oak trees have evolved many tricks to control the behavior and population size of their ancient furry rivals. Among other things, the tree has evolved to produce toxins inside of its seeds. Squirrels, in return, have evolved a digestive system that can handle the toxins fairly well, but more importantly, squirrels have changed their behavior. When they find fresh acorns, instead of eating them, they stash them in shallow hiding places to let rainwater detoxify them over several weeks to several months. A single squirrel can make hundreds of stashes all over its territory every single year. If the squirrel dies before eating the acorns or simply forgets where some of them were hidden, the squirrel has, in effect, planted brand new trees, often in places far enough from the parent tree that there will be no parent-offspring competition for sunlight when the saplings begin to grow. This is called seed dispersal, and it's actually good for a tree's evolutionary fitness. It helps them produce more successful offspring. While it's difficult to perfectly calculate evolutionary fitness, there are so many unknown variables involved, it appears that right now, in the middle of this crazy evolutionary arms race, many trees either break even or sometimes experience an overall fitness gain when those pesky squirrels move into their branches. Here we see that there exists a symbiotic continuum from parasite to mutualist. Symbiotic relationships can and do change dramatically over time. Even ticks, which almost all of us consider to be horrible parasites, when they're not carrying diseases, sometimes act more like commensalists than parasites. Due to their small size, they take very little blood from their donors. This means that a single tick won't usually cause a noteworthy fitness decline in its host. Results from a recent study show that possums may actually benefit from tick infestations. This is because they snack on ticks, and a single possum may eat over 5,000 ticks per week during tick season. Now, ticks are really small, but 5,000 per week, that is a noteworthy supplement to the possum's regular diet. Ticks are sort of like little sack lunches that come directly to you, free delivery. It might seem silly that biologists invented a word, symbiosis, to encompass everything from parasites to cooperators, but the reason for this is that parasites can evolve to become cooperators and vice versa. Understanding these evolutionary transitions is fascinating, but more importantly, this knowledge is now helping us control diseases.
For example, many of the bacteria living in your intestines actually help you digest your food. They eat the parts of it that you can't absorb and then excrete the waste, waste products that you can absorb. Yum yum. Most of the microbes living inside us today either have a mutualistic or a commensalistic relationship with us, but some of them started out as parasites. In 1991, a bacterial intestinal disease called cholera broke out in South America. As you may know, cholera causes extreme diarrhea. That's why it's so dangerous. It makes its host desperate to use the toilet and then spreads to new hosts either through dirty drinking water or through person-to-person -person contact. Biologist Paul Ewald studied its spread and the evolution of the cholera bacteria in real time. In nations with bad water filtration, the bacteria remain deadly year after year. This is because natural selection favored strains of the bacteria that would make people use the toilet more frequently, even if it eventually killed them due to dehydration, because the bacteria would contaminate more water this way and spread faster to new hosts. In countries with good water filtration, strains of the bacteria evolved toward commensalism. In these environments, natural selection favored microbes that were, quote, kinder to people because people were then healthy enough to go to school, to work, and mingle with friends and family. This allowed the bacteria to spread slowly and non-violently through human-to-human -human contact. The take-home message here is this. When there is an outbreak of cholera, not only should we immediately treat the sick, we should also distribute clean drinking water. Doing so will guide the bacteria's evolution in a direction that's good for the future of the people in the area. These fascinating interactions and evolutionary transitions from enemy to friend and sometimes from friend to enemy are all possible because of symbiosis, the long-term living together of unlike organisms. While most people have no trouble understanding how evolution causes animals to adapt to their environment, a bear to the cold, for example, we often forget that a creature's environment also includes the other organisms that share that environment. If two species live together and interact long enough, the slow process of evolution, descent with modification, acted upon by selection, can cause living things to evolve and adapt to each other.